Next on Images Imágenes, victims of teen violence speak of the insanity that left them paralyzed and confined to wheelchairs. Saludos, welcome to Images Imágenes. I'm Miguel Perez. Some are former drug dealers and addicts, and some are the victims of other people's crimes and addictions. They are members of POWER, P-O-W-E-R. It stands for people opening the world's eyes to reality, and they are here to try to open your eyes to the reality of teen violence on our streets, to discuss the dramatic increase of drug-related gun violence and the impact it is having on the victims, their families, and their communities. They are here to discuss their own personal tragedies and to tell us that what happened to them can happen to anyone. Bob Cooper is the coordinator of POWER, and with him are three of the victims of teen violence, Wilson Murphy, who was shot seven times, uh, caught in the crossfire seven times. Nestor Cantor, who was also shot seven times and was confined to a wheelchair, and Enoch Charles, another victim of senseless shootings. Gentlemen, welcome to the program. Mr. Cooper, Thanks, uh, I, th I think we should begin by explaining to our viewers what power is all about. How did it get started and what, 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 why was there a need for it? Well, the, the need is obvious, Miguel. Uh, in, in 1992, March of 92, a patient at Goldwater Hospital, um, from where, all, where power originates from, in New York, in New York uh, was watching television and, and two students from um, a high school in Brooklyn um, was shot and killed. And he was a, a, an alumni of that school, so he was angry about it and he was wondering when it was, was going to stop. Now he himself was a victim of violence. He had been shot um, in the drug trade, uh, which was his trade. But he was in lying in bed on a respirator at Goldwater, and he wrote Mayor Dinkins at the time, asking him, what is he going to do about it? Because violence is now invading the schools, and the children are getting involved. Uh, the mayor uh, responded by uh, writing back to uh, the patient and asking him to get involved. Since he is a victim, maybe the children or the, the youth in the schools would listen to him rather than adults or principals or teachers. Uh, well, he did, and he, he recruited a few members of uh, a few p few patients in the hospital uh, who were also victims, and they went out and started speaking in the schools, and it just snowballed from there, uh, which is which reminds you of this senselessness and, and how much it is in, in needed in the schools today to teach the youth about guns and about the consequences of guns, and who more, who better to teach these children than those of victims who are who are victims of the senseless shootings and the senseless violence? In the How streets. did you become involved with the project? Well, I became involved. Uh, I was asked to become involved. Uh, uh, the executive director of the hospital, Mr. Sam Lauerfeld, asked me to become in involved when um, uh, there there was a need for for a director in the group, and I did become involved. And believe me, it opened my eyes as well, as far as as far as being paralyzed. Uh, you see. People in wheelchairs, uh, they're paralyzed, and you know, you say, oh, they can't move their arms or their legs, but there's so much more that goes behind it. There's so much behind the scenes that I see day to day in the hospital that, that no one could understand and no one would realize it. So basically, that's what we try and do. We try and, and teach the youth that being around guns, you, there's a good chance that you're going to get shot, and if the bullet hits your spine, Par uh, uh, paralysis is what you'll have. And but sometimes you don't even have to be around a gun. Sometimes all you have to do is be in a neighborhood where there are guns. That's that's absolutely true. That's absolutely true. And what we and what we try and do is we try and let them know that if they know people who are with guns, or they know, uh, or, or they themselves have been have been, have had the urge, or, or the temptation to carry guns, we tell them not to because. Either you're going to go three places with guns. You're either going to go to jail, you're either going to die, or you're going to become paralyzed. There's just, there's just nothing else. Let's ask each one of our guests to tell us their story. Let's start with you, Wilson. Uh, tell us, uh, you were not involved in drug traffic. You were just caught in the middle of a shooting. Tell us what yeah, happened. Yeah, it's a case of being in the wrong place at the wrong time. When your neighborhoods are drug invested, your community are drug invested, those that's trying to make it, they, their life is at risk too, and that's why I got with the group to show all the all the positive kids that your life is still still at risk, and it's up to the parents 
you know, to, to try to, you know, join these block associations and try to rid these communities with the drugs. You, we have to gut, gut out our communities. Now, look, I was shot so up until. What were you doing? What were you doing? Oh, when I worked happened? at I worked at the uh, McDan's Hotel mm -hmm. in the Bush section of Brooklyn. I was a maintenance man. One of my guys didn't come in, so I went to the store to go get some supplies, some toiletries for the for the building. I was stopped by a neighborhood drug user, and he asked me, can I loan him $2? Now, I figured $2 is a small price to pay for him to have to hurt me, to rob me, or me have to hurt him to defend myself. So I told him, see me later, you know, come and see me later, and I'll give you the $2. <laughs> but at the time, I didn't know what this brother was into, you understand? And when you don't, when you don't know what a person was doing before he entered your presence, then you you not you have no uh, idea what can happen. Well, at the time he was sticking up drug dealers, so when they when they finally caught up with him, at that split second I was in his presence. He was I was standing right right in front of my job. I I seen about three guys walk past me, but I didn't pay it no mind because everybody knows me in the neighborhood. I grew up in the neighborhood. I didn't pay it no mind. But then my co-worker yelled from across the street, look out, Wilson, they got guns. Now, the three gentlemen that walked past me went around the corner. So it was the way the gunman was coming, I was going to run that direction. We should say that this whole story uh, was part of a program that we did recently here at uh, NJN uh, called Word Up, a special on, on right, youth right. violence. And you were here, yeah, and you were, were one here. of the guests that spoke about that. Uh -huh. uh, and Word Up uh, is something that we're all very proud uh, of at NJN. And uh, your contribution was magnificent, and long, along with uh, Mr. Cooper Thank and Nestor, who we're going to speak to Thank soon. You. But tell us, what happened? What happened at that moment? Uh, so all of a sudden, friend, somebody got friend. Gets out of a car, I understand, and starts shooting. Yeah. Some of them got out the car because the block that I work on, it had trees, you know, so the trees covered the street light, so it was kind of dark. So I didn't pay no attention about these three guys walking the street because I didn't bother nobody. And I wasn't out there in any trouble or nothing. So my co worker, yeah, he seen, he seen the guys coming behind, walking up on us with Uzi. He said, Look out, Wilson, they got guns. So the first thing, my first reaction was to run. So when I ran, I ran right into the other guys coming around the corner. I was shot seven times with a Uzi and a with nine an millimeter. After the sixth time I was shot. And the intended victim, was he shot too? Well, he was shot twice. But I don't know if they shot me because they thought I was his partner or I was just dead. Because see, when somebody puts a price on your head, anybody in your company doesn't walk. And the assailants, were they caught? They were caught three years later. They were caught three years later. But what bothers me is that it's bad enough I took seven bullets for nothing. But even after the, even after the sixth bullet, I was down. The, the, one of the perpetrators stood over me close range and shot me in my head. He tried to kill me. Now, I was talking to a young lady last night, and I said, this is what the society did to me. She said, don't blame it on society. I have to say society. Because if the world leaders would give, give our community what, it, community what it needs, there would be no need for this. If we stop worrying about sending people to the moon and getting the drugs out of the community, then it, I wouldn't be in this chair right now. And I have to do something about it because I have my kids, and then you have your kids. Charles have his kids, Rob Cooper has his kids. You know, we got to we got to make we we got to prepare for the future. I want to life. I want to get into a Nestor story, and I want you to tell me later on what it is that uh, happened to you at that hospital when you re realized that you were paralyzed. But Nestor, please tell us uh, what happened to you. Where were you at, and how did you get shot? Well, I'm a different case. You know, <laughs> um, I was hanging out with the wrong group, the wrong friends. At the time, I didn't know. You know, I thought that, I, you know, my friends were my friends, my buddies. You know, but. You know, as time goes on, you realize that, you know, everybody's not your friend. You know, and sometimes your best friend is the one that's going to kill you. You know, I was hanging out with these guys, and what happened was that these guys, they, they liked to, to hijack drug dealers, take their drugs and their money, and also their spots. So one of the drug dealers had found out where my friend Mike had lived and where he was 
you know, situated. So he came back, and at the time we were hanging out in front of his house, in front of Mike's house. And um, the person came, and he just asked who Mike was. But a second later, he must have changed his mind because he just started shooting at everybody. He didn't care who Mike was. He didn't care about my, me or my friends. You know, he just wanted to kill everybody who was there. You know, I was shot seven times. My other friend, Black, he was shot once, and now he's dead. You know, he got shot in the heart. And um, my friend Lewis, he was shot twice. He's all right, but you know, he's working and everything. And Mike, he so, somehow he got he got away from all the bullets, and it's safe somewhere. You know, we don't know where he's at, but you know, he's that, hiding st is still. He must be hiding or something. We don't know really what, what's going on with him. You know, but we we us as kids, we gotta realize you know who we hanging out with. We gotta be smart mm -hmm. enough to choose our friends. You know, sometimes our, ma our parents tell us, you know, listen, you know, this is the wrong person for you, or, you know, don't hang out with this person. But, you know, we tend not to listen. You know, we have to listen to our parents, you know. Even though they, they might have lived in a different era, you know, they've been around the block more than we have, mm -hmm. you know. So we and the effect that your illness is, uh, has had on your, your victim, uh, your, your sh the shooting, uh, and, and the fact that you're now paralyzed, what, what effect has that had on your parents? Well, you know, at first... After they uh, warned you and advised you uh, to go in the right direction. Yeah. I mean, at first, everybody was in shock. You know, they couldn't believe that something like this could have happened to their son. Mm -hmm. You know, um, my mother, you know, she didn't realize at first, you know, what was really going on. But then, as time went on, you know, sh she adjusted it to her life. And, you know, I mean, I found out that life is so precious, you know. And parents' love is so precious, also because I wouldn't, I wouldn't, have, I, I, I might not have been here, or I wouldn't be where I'm at at the level that I'm at if my parents' love wouldn't be, uh, or my mother's love wouldn't be. You know, because I thought that my friends were all all about it. You know, I thought, oh, you needed. Yeah, but it's not. You know, I needed my parents, and I needed their guide. And and after you were hurt, they were the ones that came through for you. Oh yeah, yeah, and you know, and none of my friends. I mean. A couple of my friends came around, but most of them, you know, I thought I had so many friends and everything, but, you know, most of them, it's sad to say, you know, it really hurts, you know, but a lot of them, they never came to look at me, they never came to visit. Enoch, what happened to you? Well, my case is a little different. Uh, I don't like to hang out, because in my neighborhood, I know there's a lot of violence. And, um, and I usually keep by myself, because sometimes, my parents always told me, by your company, you shall be known. And um, I got home, just got home from work. So I, um, I didn't have any money on me, so I went home and get, get the money to buy a can of beer to go back home. So I met one of my friends on the street. And um, we were standing talking. There was about 20 people around. So we were talking about basketball game. So I said, well, I'm going to go back home and listen to the game on my radio. He said, no, man, 15 minutes. Wait until the first quarter of the, f f of the game. Knicks were playing. So I said, listen, you know I don't like to hang around here, you know, because you guys make too much noise. So he said, come on, man. First quarter, you can go. So, um, I went into the restaurant. It was a restaurant there. So I said, um, okay, we go watch the game. It's a little restaurant, it's a smoke shop also. So I said, well, let me get something to eat in the meantime. So I ordered my food, looking at the game. About 9.15 in the evening, May 26, 1994. So I said, um, as soon as the food, I got the food, I'm, I'm leaving. There goes two teenagers came in. I heard them say, this is a stick up, everybody on the ground. I thought it was a joke because it was so, so early in the evening and so many people was around. So everybody fell on the floor. And I heard a big boom. And I saw, I saw the guy that shot. I said to myself, this is not a joke anymore. So the guy, the guy with the gun, he's about 16, 17 years old. 
start to tell the, uh, the guy back of the counter, give him the money. I want the money before I kill everybody in here. I saw him point the gun at my friend and pull the trigger, but the, the gun was fired. So the, the guy at the door asked him to leave, tell him, let's get out of here. And he said, hold up, hold up. He came to me and put the gun on my side and fired. And why did he pick on you? Why, why do you think he picked on because you? Because he shot, well, he shot one of the guys before he shot me. And then he, after he pointed the gun at my friend, and the gun misfired, he, then he cranked the gun again and came over and shot me f for absolutely no reason at all. I mean, because he has the gun, that's the only reason I can see why. Because the other guy was encouraging him to leave before before I got shot. Now, what happens, uh, this question is addressed to all three of you, uh, what happened when, when you got up in the hospital after uh, being unconscious, I suppose, especially you, Wilson, I understand you were in a coma, right? Yeah, uh, and you, you get up and, and you realize that uh, you are going to survive, you are going to make it, you still have several bullets in you, you require several operations, and they roll in that wheelchair that tells you that you're going to be bound to a wheelchair for quite a long time, perhaps for the rest of your life. At first, you know, when I, when I found out how many, how many times I was hit with these weapons, I was, like, somewhat impressed and made that so I didn't think I was that strong, you mm -hmm. understand? But I know God was watching over me. And when you laying in that bed, before they bring that wheelchair to you, you, you don't really know how badly you hurt because you're laying down on the bed. But when the doctors roll that wheelchair in, that was the beginning of a new life for me. That's when I really knew how hurt I was, you know. And uh, I looked at that chair, and my sister Gwen, I used to get mad because I was in a wheelchair. My sister Gwen told me, she said, listen, you got to stop hating that wheelchair. That wheelchair is your best friend now because without that wheelchair, you cannot move. So if you're gonna hate that wheelchair, that wheelchair is your best friend. That chair can do something for you that me, Angie, Chris, or nobody could do for you. So stop hating that. But to see that doctor come in that room with that wheelchair and say, this is yours, you, you start comparing to the way you used to be and to the way you, your new lifestyle. And it's very depressed. It's very depressing. Nestor, and when you go uh, to the schools and the prisons and speak uh, on behalf of power uh, about that, that realization that you faced in the hospital that you were going to be confined to a wheelchair, what do you tell other kids uh, about what happened to you and what they should avoid? Well, um, first of all, I mean, I realized that I was paralyzed while I was on the floor before the ambulance and everything came in. And, you know, I just I thank God that, you know, I had my sister was still myself. conscious. Yeah, I was. I never, I never went, you know, unconscious. I had my sister on one side and her best friend on the other, holding my hand, you know. And I found out, you know, that my legs I couldn't move them. But you know, I put that aside and I just kept on breathing because that was the only way that I would stay alive, you know. And now, you know, as I go to these schools, I just keep telling these kids, you know, that this is the reality of, of a bullet, you know. I knew, I knew the consequences. I knew that, you know, if I was ever to be shot, I would have been either dead or worse. And this is what happens, you know? And I told these kids, you know, at least listen, you know, take us as, a, as an example, you know, that if you do end up living after the bullet, you know, you might just end up like this, you know? So unless you have a strong mind and a strong will to live, you're not gonna survive. You know, you're just gonna be depressed and you're just gonna wanna die. So if, if you don't have a, a strong mind and a strong will to live and survive after the bullet, don't even mess around with guns. But you also get, uh, from being involved with power, you do get some kind of reward, the fact that you're oh. giving something back to other, to other youth, and you, that you're talking to them. I mean, this is, this is something that must be a mission for you guys now, right? Oh yeah, you know? oh yeah, of course. See, the thing about it, um, no kid or anybody don't want to be in a wheelchair. And when you're active, as I was, in a wheelchair is no fun. Because I like, I, I love to swim. 
mm -hmm. love scuba diving. Now I can't do, do any of it because I'm here. I like to go camping. I can't go camping in a wheelchair. I like to travel, I travel a lot. Now it cuts me down. I like to go play with my grandchildren. I can't do that the way that I want to. I like to go take my daughters them out to a movie or take them some places. I can't do it the way that I want to. So it really have effect on me. But you see, I'm strong. I know I'm going to live long. So I don't let this bother me. Every day I get up, I pray to God that I'm alive and I feel good about myself. So I must go on. And that's why I go around to these different schools and tell the kids, choose your friends. Beware of what is around you at all times. Sometimes you, you don't know, but be alert at all times because looking around, listen, and look at us will give you some idea. If you don't look around and be aware and choose your friends, you can end up like us. Mr. Cooper, uh, the group not only does what we're doing here today as far as uh, talking uh, and, exp and explaining what happened to them and making other youth see uh, what to avoid, right. how to behave, they also have done some lobbying work in oh, Washington yes. uh, and with the state government in New York. Where, Tell wherever, us about that. Wherever the call goes out for the power group, we, we were uh, uh, up front, we went to Washington, we've been to Albany, uh, we've been, uh, we uh, testified in front of the Black and Puerto Rican Caucus in Albany it was two years ago. We were in Washington, D.C. Um, we were also um, at the um, uh, at the beginning of a crime bill, or a, a uh, the, the City Council of New York was passing a uh, commission on teen violence, and we testified in front of the New York City Council uh, in, in promoting that and helping helping them pass this legislation so they can pr provide information to other politicians about the the spread of violence uh, in, in New York City. Gun and, and control around. legislation? It, it was uh, basically it was just an investigation um, uh, set up a, a committee to investigate why is there so much violence mm -hmm. and they they interviewed uh, 800, mem 800 uh, students and, and youth throughout New York uh, in regards to gun violence and how they get guns, where they get guns, why do they get guns and they came up with statistics and uh, with those statistics, help them uh, target some areas and of ways in which they can uh, prevent the violence and maybe help educate the students uh, and the youth. And part of that, out of the outcome, was they needed um, groups such as Power to go out and speak uh, on behalf of, uh, of to the children and to the youth uh, to uh, rescind and to, to uh, stop guns and stop the violence. Um, what we, kind of feedback do you get uh, from, oh, from the groups that you speak to? We get a, a lot of feedback. I mean, the feedback ranges from tears to cheers. Uh, we, we've gone to Rikers Island in New York, and, and we, the inmates have cried regarding uh, to the violence. Because, you know, what I mentioned before about death, jail, or paralysis, there are two of the three that are in the same room. And the inmates look at the power group and say, this is a life sentence to them. I mean, right. this is them. Sure. This is the way they can be for the rest of their lives. Any of the power members would change places with an inmate in a second without hesitation, no matter how long the bid was for that person in jail. Um, if, if they're in the 25 years, Wilson would say, I'll change a place with you. I'll get out in 25 years and I'll be able to walk again. Mm. It, it, is, it is very, very volatile, especially when we go into the prisons. We don't have much time, but uh, if from each one of you, if possible, if we have the time, I'd like a little bit of advice. What, what, what's your message? Uh, we got a one minute apiece. Uh, mm. What's your message uh, to wow. the people who are listening, especially to the youth that's listening and watching this program? My uh, message is that the kids are the world of tomorrow. And they, they got to put down the guns and pick up the books because the pen is mightier than the sword. And if our future is being destroyed before my face, then there, there is no future. There, there's nothing left but for this world to self-destruct. And when you got babies carrying guns, you know, and you got babies killing people, you know, there's no, there's no love, you know. We got to stop the violence. Word up, we got to stop the violence. 
and we got to pick up, put, put, put that uh, that sword down, and pick up that book. You know. Well, well, te teenagers always think that they're invincible, and there's nobody invincible when you walk with a gun because the person that that you held up or held you up may take your own gun and kill you. So leave guns alone. You're better off without guns. And if you have friends with guns, tell them to leave them alone. Mm. Because you get nowhere with guns but in jail or in the wheelchair. Nestor, right. and as you well know, the combination of guns and drugs is a bad combination, right? Oh, yeah. You know, my message to these kids and to, to the young adults, you know, let, let us stop taking each other's hopes and dreams, you know, because when, we, when each of us kill someone, you know, we, we're actually taking a part of the future away from each other. So please, man, just, just stop killing each other. You know, think and stop killing each other. You were telling me, Nestor, we got a few seconds more, uh, you were telling me that uh, the, the way your mother reacted to, to your being in a wheelchair, especially when you were here for the uh, town meeting that mm -hmm. we did, uh, Word Up Stop the Violence, the name of the town hall meeting that we did with you. Uh, you were telling me about your mother loving you so much and being feeling impotent now, not being able to help you. Tell me about that. Well, the truth of the matter is that, you know, my mother loves me, but, you know, now she sees a son that can't walk. And, I mean, that, that has impacted her life so much. You know, she's, you know, sh she tried so much to put, to put my life as it was, but it's never going to be, you know, unless I start walking again, you know. But she shows her love and, and, and she shows everything else. Even though, you know, I can't walk now, you know, she still loves me. And that, that has changed a lot, you know. Even for the family, family-wise, you know, they have shown me so much love that I never knew before. Well, I thank you all for being here. It's been a real pleasure having, having you us. on again at NJN. And uh, we are uh, very pleasure. proud to have had you and to, to, to share your story with our audience. Uh, we have to go, but uh, we hope to see you right here very soon on NJN uh, for another edition of Images Imágenes. I'm Miguel Perez. Thank you for watching, and hasta pronto.